You know, if we'd had a regular rainy season last year, we probably would start to see the new flush of growth by now, but I think with this year, it's gonna be a little bit more labored. <laughs> ah, so here we have a member of the Morning Glory family. This is actually a shrubby morning glory. It grows on these kind of semi-woody stems, maybe attaining a maximum height of about uh, a meter and a half to two meters at maximum usually. Um, but this one is actually really well adapted to the woodland um, and our woodlands get burnt every few years and in some cases every year, um, this species will, if it is burnt, will then flower directly at ground level. But because it hasn't burnt in here, it can actually flower a little higher up on the, uh, on the stems. So this is Ipomia vernalis, um, a beautiful member of the Morning Glory family with these lovely kind of white and pink as usual trumpet shaped flowers. Um, this is the usual time that they are flowering. Um, that kind of change over from our cold dry season into the hot dry season. And um, they will continue to flower on and off for you know a week or two. I just see actually a little bee that's come to, uh, to seek nectar and pollen from it. And you can just imagine how important these flowers are actually at this time of year for these really, really early insects. So this looks to be some kind of solitary hover bee that's, uh, that's coming in there. It doesn't seem to be too fussed at all about my being here, which is quite nice. And off he maybe goes. But lovely to see this and um, a nice kind of sign that maybe there will be more for us to find. Another fantastic and kind of lovely feature of some of these Miombo woodlands are the termitaria. So these are usually treated as a completely separate um, aspect within the woodland in that it creates its own little microenvironment and usually has a distinct flora that grows on it and not as commonly in the more open areas of the woodland. So as the name would suggest, this is created, this whole mound has been created by generations upon generations upon generations of termites as they've been slowly building and amassing uh, soil to make their home. Um, and that concentration, usually of clays and things like that, increases the nutrient content of the environment, as well as then the water holding capacity of the area around it, on it and in the general vicinity. And you get a distinct flora that will grow on these mounds that is harder to find growing in the open woodland. Um, here I see things like the Euclea, um, again, we saw just a little further down closer to the, the dam where there was more water available for that. But then I also see this lovely climbing shrub called Marua juncia, which is just kind of arching over this Euclea branch that is bent down and has got its nice little white pom-pom-esque flowers that are open, a little too uh, out of our reach to easily get down and show up close. Um, but uh, but a, a nice little aspect of it. Now, <clears throat> the construction of these mounds happen over a, a, a period of time that we, we, we can't really easily guess as to what the age of something like this is. This mound could be well over a thousand years old usually um, and is not necessarily continuously occupied by termites. There might be some catastrophe, the main colony is killed off and then the mound might be recolonized by another batch of termites years later, decades later, whatever it might be effectively. These mounds are never continuously occupied, um, but do have kind of growth cycles effectively. Um, 
and very, very interesting in terms of the fact that what we're seeing is woody vegetation at the moment will then also give rise in rains to a herbaceous vegetation that is also generally pretty specialized around the base of termite mounds effectively. Um, you know, maybe we'll be able to come back and see in the rains, but um, at the moment it is also still very dry as most of the, the, the woodland is. Um, but these kinds of large mounds are just such a lovely natural feature to our Miombo woodlands um, that you can't not just walk by them. You really need to kind of appreciate them for what they are. Let me see if I can get a, uh, uh, a flower of the Marua. Let me be able to, to see up close. <sighs> Uh, oh yeah, okay, here we go. So this is the Marua Juncia flower up close. This is in the Caparaceae family. Very intricate. All these long stamens with the stigma and the um, carpels coming from that right there, although unless you know the flower it's hard to see. Um, very reduced petals. You can see the petals at the very base. Um, and some of these species actually don't even have any petals. So the main kind of ornamentation is actually brought about by that kind of pom-pom-esque nature of the stamens around the, around the stigma. Hmm. I was wondering if it does have a smell. I can't really tell very well, but Smells a little bit like burnt sugar to me. I might have to get that confirmed from other people though. <laughs> All right. Oh, and we've also got a little tiny Vigna, Vigna pygmaea. So this is a tiny little perennial member of the pea family. This is called Vigna pygmaea. Pygmaea being pygmy or small. And even you can see this area hasn't been burnt and it is only flowering, you know, five centimeters off ground level. This is what it does. It puts up its flowers very early on these short little stalks, two, three, maybe four flowers per stalk. Here we have the developing fruits of a species um, in the Aurelia family. This is the Genetania. This is generally commonly here called the carrot tree because it does smell quite a bit of carrots, the bruised leaves and, and if you break the stems you kind of get that hint of carrots effectively. Um, it never grows into a very big tree, I think the maximum I've ever seen this is about three to four meters tall, maybe even reaching to five in some cases with a thickness of the stem that might get up to about 10 centimeters across. Um, it's actually a fairly quick growing tree but it is also heavily browsed by game, by livestock. Um, and, and so it can actually, usually in situations like this, just be kind of stunted by the browse, browsing activity that happens with it. Um, it is also very early flowering as the fact that these are now in, in fruit attests to. Um, it's a lovely small member of the Miombo woodland. 
and um, it's always nice to see when it is growing really really uh, well and and there's a number of trees just along the edge here in various different stages um, but even despite having had the drought that we did last year you can still see that these put on they still have quite a bit of energy and it would take repeated droughts for this thing to be worn down to the point in time where it doesn't have any energy even to flower in the next year. So it's still a nice um, visual to see that this thing is, is still healthy enough to put on flowers, put on fruits, with the fact that we haven't had any rain for months upon months and it will probably still be at least another two months, uh, one to two months before we get the, the, the rains for this thing to then finally leaf out. We actually have another very early flowering member of the pea family. Uh, this is very closely related to the initial one that we saw, Pig, um, Vigna pygmea. But this one has flowers that are, what, four, three, four, five times the size. This is Vigna antunesiana. Uh, like the pygmea, it has that strategy of producing the flower stalk well before any of the leaves will emerge. And again, this will have several flowers off of the stalk. The pods will develop on that. And then once the rains come, the leaves and stems will emerge and they will kind of climb up surrounding vegetation or creep along the ground. Um, this Vigna is obviously um, different both in size, but then in the keel, which usually curves to one side and almost looks kind of deformed. So um, this is a fairly easy one to tell apart.